Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Duke Initiative for Science and Society for the latest panel discussion in our coronavirus conversation series. We are delighted that we are able to co-host today's event with the Duke Global Health Institute, the Duke Law School Center for Innovation and the Law, the Georgetown Law O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health, the Harvard University Petrie Flom Center for Bioethics, the Sabin Vaccine Institute, the Stanford Center for Law and the Biosciences, the UNC HIV Cure Center, and the Yale School of Public Health. My name is Sarah Rispin Sedlak, and I'm the faculty lead for the coronavirus conversations here at Duke Science and Society. In a moment, I'll introduce speakers and moderators for today's discussion, which will be taking a look inside the COVID-19 vaccine trials. After the event, I invite you to visit the Science and Society website, scienceandsociety.duke.edu to learn about upcoming events. While you're on the Science and Society website, we also invite you to learn more about our master's degree program, where our students and faculty go in depth on the very science, technology, and policy questions that we discussed during this coronavirus conversation series. Please allow me to introduce our panelists. First, we have Dr. Cynthia Cindy Gay, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at UNC and the Medical Director of the UNC HIV Cure Center. In her career, she has focused primarily on HIV research, including a variety of HIV clinical and translational research. In June, Dr. Gay agreed to lead the phase three clinical trial for the Moderna vaccine for COVID at UNC. And given her schedule, we are very grateful to have her today. Dr. Chip Walter is a professor of pediatrics at Duke a, me a member of the Duke Clinical Research Institute and the Chief Medical Officer at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute. Dr. Walter has long worked on vaccine development, vaccine safety, vaccine coverage, prevention, and treatment of infectious disease diseases. He has been involved in many aspects of COVID vaccine and treatment development, including serving as the principal investigator for the phase one, two, three trial for the Pfizer COVID vaccine at Duke. Finally, our moderator today is Dr. Nita Farahani, who is the director of Duke's Initiative for Science and Society and the Robinson O. Everett Professor of Law at the Duke Law School. She's a leading scholar on the ethical, legal, and social implications of emerging technologies. She served on the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues from 2010 until 2017, and currently serves on a number of boards, including as a member of the National Advisory Council for the National Institute for Neurological Disease and Stroke, an elected member of the American Law Institute, and a member of the Neuroethics Working Group of the U.S. Brain Initiative. Dr. Farahani is a co-editor-in-chief and co-founder of the Journal of Law and the Biosciences, and is on the Board of Advisors for Scientific American. With that, I'll hand things over to Professor Farahani to begin the conversation. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks to everybody for being here today. Um, thanks to our panelists and thanks to our co-sponsors. Um, I'm excited for us to dive in, and I know that our time is short together, and we've had a lot of questions that have been submitted in advance, but we also have questions um, that will come in uh, throughout our conversation today, which we will continue to track and continue to try to address as many as we can. Um, one thing Sarah left off is not only uh, am I the director of Duke, uh, Duke Science and Society, but I'm also a research participant um, in the Moderna study. And so this is truly inside uh, the va COVID vaccine trials um, in that you're getting the perspective from both the researchers as well as uh, a perspective for somebody who has participated as well. Um, we, uh, I think, should get started. Um, Chip is able to provide to us both a perspective on Pfizer as well as AstraZeneca, which restarted in the US last week. Um, and so as you ask questions, these are questions that can pertain to all of them, but we'll start um, with a question that's on everybody's mind. So election day has come and gone. Uh, and despite some claims to the contrary that there would be a vaccine ready to go on election day, um, it's clear that while the results are still being tabulated, there is no vaccine that is currently available. Nevertheless, um, as I understand it, both Pfizer and Moderna have fully enrolled their trials for phase three trials. And so um, I thought I'd start with you, Cindy, which is where are we from your perspective, both in terms of submission of data, um, you know, how the trial is going and what the anticipated timeline might be for uh, having some updated results? Yeah, it is the million dollar question, right? 
Um, uh, what I can can say with surety is that the Moderna study has built in two interim analysis, and um, the first one should happen shortly. So it will be the first time when um, the um, folks outside of the study who will be looking at unblinded data will be able to see how many events. So by events, how many people in both the placebo arm and in the vaccine arm have acquired uh, SARS-CoV-2 and if there's a difference. I would, my, my personal opinion is that I think it might be early in the first interim analysis to be able to see that difference um, and have, you know, really sort of uh, hit it out of the park, but that would be nice. Um, so I, I think we're poised to if not with this first one, with the second interim analysis, perhaps be able to see a signal with the vaccine. Um, and that would be um, likely later in December. Um, so it really is, you know, shifting um, timelines for, I think all of these vaccine studies um, in the sense that, you know, it's key to enroll participants who are at risk in both in the study so that we could see a difference in the two arms and so it's really about um, how much we sort of enrich the study population for those people who are at risk and we're acquired and whether we can see a difference between the two arms. So my, my best guess, and it is just that, would be that we might have uh, some signals say by, by January. And I don't know if Chip wants to, to agree or disagree, but... Um, yeah, I'm interested in Chip's perspective. Either. Just to just unpack a little bit of what you said before I go to Chip on his timeline. Um, you mentioned when an outside board would first get a look at the results and just to make sure that everybody who is listening in understands the process. So um, the researchers are, are blind, the participants are blind. It's a double blind randomized controlled study, um, but uh, there's a, a peak at the data as I understand it, is that right? Um, yes. Yeah, so there's a pre-identified data safety, safety and monitoring board. So these would be individuals with the appropriate expertise and experience. Um, there would be statisticians that would be included and they would be able to have a look at the unblinded data from the study, um, but no one involved with, with the study itself, including the sponsor or any of the sites or um, anyone with oversight would, be, would have that look. And when you said we're looking to see a difference between the two arms, because for Moderna, which is 30,000 participants, there were 15,000 people who received the placebo, 15,000 people who received um, the vaccine. And you're looking to see, uh, assuming kind of uh, that both arms have the same amount of exposure to um, the disease that uh, which, you know, is there a significant difference between who becomes sick, uh, between those who had received the vaccine and those who had received the placebo? Is that right? Correct. Okay. So let's turn it over to Chip. You have two different vaccines under your peer review right now. So you might have a slightly different perspective on which one is likely to uh, progress and when we can have some data, but I'm interested in your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Cindy's timelines are pretty accurate that she she has given, uh, you know, the, both the Pfizer and Moderna trials started roughly at the same time um, and actually filled their enrollments pretty much at the same time. Uh, so the Pfizer study, we actually filled our enrollment for adult, the adult population about a week or so ago. <clears throat> um, and, and now are starting to enroll some children in, or older adolescents uh, in the study. So 17 and 18 year olds uh, in the study. But uh, in terms of timelines, I think it's really likely that probably, I mean, we, there will be a peak um, and I think it probably will be soon um, from all indications. Um, uh, we're getting you know, a lot of requests to date for data. I, I will say, I, I think the request to submit data is probably uh, the most rapid turnaround time that I've ever participated. I mean, I've participated in a lot of trials in 30 years. Um, but this probably is the most rapid turnaround other than perhaps uh, for the H1N1 pandemic uh, back, back in 2009. Um, but this is, you know, it's, it's really a, a continual request submitting data. Um, and I, I think it's likely that we may see a interim look maybe sometime later this month and something in December. But again, I, I, you know, I think it's early. Will we see any, you know, signal with the first look I don't I don't know I don't know that we can predict that I think we're all hopeful we'll see something um, um, but but I don't think we know I don't have the crystal ball 
You mentioned Pfizer, an interim look. It's a little bit different process-wise for Pfizer, is that right? And that it's not a, it's not the same external board because Pfizer's not doing it in the same way as operation warp speed as the other trials are, is that right? Correct, so there are um, several of the trials where there's a public-private partnership um, under the COVID prevention network umbrella. Um, and many of the companies where the trials are, are partnered with uh, the COVID prevention network, um, which is a national network sponsored by, by the NIH. Um, and and the, the, most of the, or many of the trials are, are being conducted under that umbrella. So I would, the Moderna trial, the AstraZeneca trial, the John, Janssen trial, um, and uh, a Novavax trial later on will be conducted under that. Pfizer uh, uh, has done, conducted their trial more independently, um, but they also have an external board and oversight safety board, so. All right, well, let's, let's imagine a world in which there's signal, right? There's a peak in December or in January, there's signal uh, which suggests that the vaccine is effective. Um, and then we have all kinds of questions, right, about uh, how effective is it? Is it, um, does it have lasting effects? Does it wane over time? Um, is it 40% effective, 50% effective? Like what exactly does it do? Um, that's our kind of crystal ball of let's, let's, let's assume that there's signal and then there's these kind of other issues that we're gonna be grappling with. Some of the questions that people have asked um, are questions about, for example, uh, what about that? Like what, what would it mean if there's signal and how good does that signal need to be? Um, what does 50% effective mean? Uh, and, um, and, and how are we gonna know about kind of short-term, medium-term, long-term effectiveness when there is signal? So this is kind of unpacking what some of that data may be. Who wants to take that one first? That's a lot in once, but you can you could just start with you know what would effective mean. Um, so you know when we're looking for signal, uh, there's both the kind of FDA expectations of signal of what's the minimum threshold that's necessary for um, you know approval, and then you know it, what would that actually mean for disease burden. So people don't necessarily understand that translation of you know if it's 50% effective, does that mean you know, that 50% less likely of getting it, but you're still 50% likely of getting it, you know, what does it look like? Yeah, so when, you, when you're when you traditionally looking at this, you look at uh, attack rates uh, in the population to, to get a, a, a percent efficacy. So when we, we look at a t an attack rate in the vaccinated in the vaccinated population, and we look at an attack rate in an unvaccinated population, uh, to, to come up with a, a proportion uh, of the population that, that looks to be protected when you compare it to a, a totally unvaccinated population. Um, so you'll come up with a, an efficacy estimate. So what we're shooting for is that you'll get a, about a 50% reduction in, in attack rate. So, um, so the, in, in this case, the attack rate in the unvaccinated population is the population that that uh, got placebo, um, and uh, you know, obviously the attack rate in the, the vaccinated populations are those that got either of the vaccines. Uh, so you you really do want to see a you know a redu a redu fifty percent reduction in the in the attack rate in the in the vaccinated population as compared to an unvaccinated population. What's really important, as Cindy pointed out, is that in order to figure that out, you have to have uh, enough COVID around. Um, Unfortunately, there's uh, enough COVID around in the United States right now to be able to, to do that. We're in that situation. Um, and I think as we're heading into a bigger peak, um, you know, we may be able to, if we don't arrive at answers on this first look, I think we'll be able to arrive at answers, unfortunately, more quickly uh, because attack rates are, are pretty pretty high in some, some areas particularly. So. Fortunately, here in North Carolina, it's a, not quite as high as in some other places in the Midwest, so. My understanding is that, and one of the questions we had was that the population that you have recruited, part of the screening to be uh, a research participant was looking for people who were in occupations or due to other risk factors were more likely to be exposed. 
um, to COVID. This isn't a challenge trial, so we're not actually, you know, injecting um, SARS-CoV-2 into individuals after they've been given the vaccine. But the hope is that whether it's a healthcare worker or somebody who is working in a grocery store or working in some population where they have um, a higher risk of exposure, uh, those were the individuals that were included in the study or based on the screening. Is that is that correct for both or all three actually? I think that's correct for all of the COVID-19 vaccine studies that um, they really are trying to um, assess and enroll those who are at some risk for the sort of um, obvious um, point we made that in order to be able to tell that the vaccine works, you need to have um, people who are going to get um, through no fault of their own, but through their life and work circumstances uh, become infected. And we want to be able to see whether the vaccine can, to, can decrease that. Um, either infection altogether or symptomatic infection. Okay, while I have you, um, so the uh, one of the questions starting with the Pfizer and the Moderna study is these are both mRNA vaccines, which are different. We, we don't have any human vaccines that have yet been approved um, as mRNA vaccines. What is the difference? What's the advantage of using an mRNA vaccine? Um, why was it able, why are we able to move so much faster than we previously could using an mRNA vaccine? Um, and do you worry that we're moving so quickly with a vaccine modality that has never previously been approved for human use? Well, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Chip. Um, I, he's probably more equipped to answer this. I think the real advantage of the mRNA vaccines is the platform itself, which does allow um, the, the vaccine to be, the, or the target of the vaccine to be shifted quite quickly. And also the manufacturing is also, um, I, I wouldn't say simpler process necessarily, but it's um, much quicker to adapt it from one vaccine to another. So it doesn't involve um, uh, uh, a cell culture process, which is, uh, I think, more uh, complicated in some ways for um, producing vaccines. So it is both the, the platform, which allows you to shift from one vaccine to another, uh, sorry, vir virus target from one to another. And also once that's complete, being able to scale up the manufacturing quite quickly. I think the disadvantage is, as you pointed out, it's just we have less experience. But however, several of these mRNA vaccines have been tested for other viruses and have been found to be safe. I don't have a concern about the safety um, given the, the many other studies and many other viruses for which it's been used. I think the question is just whether it's going to work for this particular uh, virus to uh, produce enough effective neutralizing antibodies to have, uh, have an impact. Um, Chip, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, just to kind of add on to what, what you said, I think that you're, what you said is very accurate. I think the, you know, one of the advantages of this platform is, is that it's, um, you know, pretty much, it's pretty easy to manufacture or to make a vaccine uh, relative to other, other vaccine platforms. So I think that's probably why you're seeing both of these products, the Pfizer and, and uh, Moderna uh, mRNA products really kind of early out of the gate and probably will be first to be approved. Uh, again, I don't know that necessarily the um, manufacturer and further down the road distribution uh, because of some of the cold chain issues with, with particularly, um, I know the Pfizer vaccine may, may be a little bit, you know, pose a few more problems um, in terms of delivery. Um, in, in terms of, you know, what we know, yes, this platform has, there's no approved, currently approved vaccine for this platform, as Nita pointed out, you've said, but um, actually before this trial, before COVID, we were actually poised uh, to start an mRNA vaccine study in, in children for other respiratory uh, pathogens. Um, and uh, so, and it's, you know, been uh, evaluated with flu and, and several other, other pathogens as well, and, and pretty well, pretty well studied. Um, but, you know, again, none, nothing has gotten farther and en far enough down the road for approval. I, I think, you know, if we see that these vaccines are successful, um, it will really, I think, change 
uh, where we go in the direction of vaccinology. Um, I, I think um, it, it really holds a lot of promise uh, for future vaccines and vaccine development for other pathogens, not, not just COVID. So um, I want to come to safety in a moment because Cindy mentioned that you weren't particularly worried about the safety profile um, in, in, in at least the Moderna vaccine or the mRNA vaccines that we're looking at more generally. But before we get there, um, my understanding is that both Moderna and Pfizer and maybe also the AstraZeneca are um, targeting the, the spike protein. Is, is that right for all of them? Um, and uh, and so some of the questions that people have had with respect to efficacy is um, looking at, for example, the, the current wave in Europe, uh, it looks like there may be mutations that are occurring that that might partially explain why there's such a significant uptick in Europe. And as we've looked across it, some of the genetic sequencing that's been done, it's clear that there are some mutations that are occurring. Um, does focusing on the spike protein, is that, has that remained constant such that we would expect these vaccines, if they are efficacious, to work um, kind of regardless of the spike protein? Or is that a potential concern that the uh, kinds of antibodies that are being developed are being developed to the spike protein uh, and um, you know, mutations may make it less effective over time? Yeah, I mean, I think the concern you would have is that the spike protein changes over time and, and, uh, and evolves and, and then you may develop uh, viruses that, that uh, for which the antibodies that you've produced from a prior COVID vaccine may not prevent you again uh, from a, a future different, uh, different COVID strain or, uh, you know, a coronavirus strain. So I, I think uh, we do worry about that. Um, those are kind of the unknowns. Um, you know, we're developing a vaccine now for SARS-CoV-2, but what will come down the pipe later on and, and really ultimately what you want is potentially a vaccine that is more cross-protective against a number of different different coronaviruses. And I think, you know, people are, are I know uh, people are doing work here and at UNC uh, and Dr. Barrett's lab and Dr. Haynes' lab here uh, uh, looking at that those issues, so. Okay, well, let's turn to safety, which is definitely on everybody's mind. And it's on everybody's mind, not just respect to um, Moderna and Pfizer, but also the AstraZeneca trial, which was on, on hold. So I wanna come to the AstraZeneca trial as well, but, but let's just start with the, the safety profiles. Um, so, you know, what are the potential side effects that we're worried about? And, and one participant um, submitted a question in advance and said that, uh, that they were a trial participant and they were caught off guard by um, the, the side effects that they had after the second um, injection, their booster injection, that they had spiked a fever of 102, that they had had um, a sore arm, uh, that it had passed after uh, a day or two, but that um, you know it had made that person not go to work that day. And that's what some people are reporting. And so uh, you know, what, what are the side effects? Uh, how would we, if, if that, Person and who knows if they did or not get the vaccine, they might, you know, might be a placebo effect. But if, if that's a effect that we might expect from the booster shot, um, is that considered a severe side effect? Uh, you know, how, what is the safety profile and how, and how does it look so far? What are the side effects that you're expecting from these vaccines? And and why don't we start with Moderna and Pfizer, and then let's talk about the AstraZeneca okay. um, ones that are more public about the uh, the couple of, of side effects that were reported that led to the hold. Yeah, I, I think in general, you know, one of the things that I'm counseling the participants when they enroll in the study is that the side effects really are side effects you can see with any vaccine, both in, in clinical trials and in clinical practice. Um, and there are, across all the vaccines that are approved and that we give, there are some that seem to have more, we call it reactogenicity, so local um, um, uh, symptoms and those that have more systemic, such as the low grade fever, for example. Um, so I would say that in our experience at UNC with the study and in the phase one and some of the phase two data that I've seen, that that's an unusual to have a, a high fever that would keep someone from doing what they would normally want to do. Certainly we, we do see um, uh, in the participants um, local tenderness, soreness, it does appear to oftentimes be um, a little bit um, 
um, more prominent after the second dose. So um, I would say that that's um, expected, not particularly worrisome. And, and um, the data in our experience so far, it's been mild and not interfering with what people want to do. But the, you know, there's always going to be some variability across individuals because we are so different and varied about how that experience is going to be. Um, which is so. It's not to say that that um, experience of that one participant. I believe it. Um, I would say it's not the norm. And then I think you know how how people would tolerate that across different vaccines is all about risk benefit. And we on a constant basis are assessing risk benefit in what we do every day, whether you realize it or not. Um, so there are other vaccines such as the tetanus booster. I just had to have mine because I got my flu shot at the same time. And it does, you know, my arm was sore for probably two days. Um, is it worth it to me to get that? Yes, it is. If you think about the risk of either um, moderate to severe COVID, having uh, people out um, of what they would normally want to do for their daily activities for much longer than a day, I would say most of us um, would think that, that the benefit of the vaccine, if it's found to be effective versus that risk, um, it would be worth it. Um, but hopefully I've answered the question. I'm now trying to remember what all the aspects were to it. No, I think um, you've answered the question. And I mean, just to underscore what you said, yeah. um, reactogenicity is what you said, right? Which is fever and sore arm are really just a signal that the immune system is responding, right? Fever alone, uh, as my pediatrician likes to tell me, fever for our children is not uh, something necessarily bad in and of itself. It's the immune system response. It doesn't signal that somebody's sick or have, has a problem if they get a vaccine and then get a fever. Is that right? Correct. I have this conversation again and again with my patients in clinic when I'm trying to um, persuade them to get the flu shot that some of those mild symptoms, such as the soreness, the low-grade fever, feeling achy, all of those things are in a way your immune system telling you that the vaccine is doing what we want it to do. Um, in, in reality, when we get a fever and feel you know, crappy when we get a, a, a respiratory infection or the flu, it's not the virus itself that's causing those symptoms, it's our immune response to it. So those mild symptoms um, that we, to some degree, um, are not surprised to see with, when we get vaccines are in fact uh, sort of a sign that the immune system is responding to the vaccine. Okay, Chip, so you're on the hook now for safety for both Pfizer as well as then let's turn to the AstraZeneca trial and talk a little bit about the pause that occurred and uh, you know what that was all about and if they're different in terms of the safety profiles of the two. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit first about reactogenicity and then uh, for the Pfizer vaccine and then and then uh, launch into the AstraZeneca vaccine. So. So uh, with the Pfizer trial, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, Cindy's correct in saying, you know, the typical side effects are those that you would see from, from any vaccine. I guess my experience is if I put it up against all the flu shots we give, I would say it's probably a little bit more reactogenic. We did have some people, and I don't know whether they got vaccine or placebo, and it could be placebo effect, but we did have some people complain of, you know, some, some fatigue the next day uh, usually resolved pretty quickly, but they said that they had to like lay low a little bit the next day. Um, uh, we had a few people that had low grade fevers in the study as, as or low grade out temperature elevations in the study as well. Nothing that I think that was, um, you know, uh, too severe in, in any way. Um, you know, I do think, you know, when you're looking at, at, um, vaccine side effects, usually we grade them in different ways. So, you know, whether they're mild, moderate, or severe, and, and severe ones are ones that would prevent somebody from doing their routine activities. And, you know, some people did when they reported and complained of severe fatigue, so they, they stayed home. Um, there's also other categories for rating side effects. So we have categories of serious adverse events versus non-serious adverse events. So it's really different than how we grade them in, in severity. And serious adverse events are things we that you know generally would have a person end up in the hospital or something really much more uh, signif a significant event, um, such as you know what was reported in, in the AstraZeneca study. So uh, side effects, again, uh, and I do counsel people in the Pfizer trial that they may have more side effects after the second dose. So they may you know, have more, more of a sore arm. 
and also if they you know they may see a little bit more fatigue or something like that after um, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, it's actually quite interesting that the side effect profile is a little different. So people, rather than having more side effect after the second dose, uh, uh, in the small report uh, of the study that was published, you know, only a few people got second doses actually, but side effects seem to be a little bit more the general things that you might see after a vaccine fatigue, muscle ache, um, a little temperature elevation, um, tiredness, uh, achiness, or sore sore arms, mu muscle aches. Um, that is um, tends to be a little bit more after the first dose uh, in in the Astra with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which again is a adenovirus vectored vaccine. Um, in terms of um, the let me pause you there for one second yep. just to ask, which is. Um, do I remember correctly that the AstraZeneca vaccine placebo is different? It's not saline like the saline. Pfizer and Moderna trials, but it's actually something like a, a meningitis or something uh, a vaccine. Is that right? In the trial that was published, the phase one study that they, as their comparator, they did use a men um, meningococcal vaccine as the comparator. Uh, in the trial that's being uh, done here in the U.S. with the COVID prevention network in AstraZeneca, it's a, a saline placebo. So, so it's a so you're going to see a more pronounced difference potentially then between side effects of uh, saline versus yes um, the the live or not live but the vaccine um, versus if you're looking at it with the meningococcal vaccine, which has itself some side effects of sore arm and things like that, right? Right, potentially you'll see more side effects. Yes, and so the, if you're doing a side-by-side -side comparison, yeah, you shouldn't see as many with, with saline unless it's just placebo effect or some intercurrent problem that somebody had an intercurrent illness. Um, in terms of the um, you know pause that we had in, in the AstraZeneca uh, study, I think, you know, uh, I will say that having done studies for a, a lot of years, um, and vaccine studies in particular, um, it's not uncommon for studies to go on pause at all. Um, it, that happens. Um, was, this, uh, was it a pause or a hold? Right, it was, was, hold. This... It was halt, halted, yeah. Okay. Um, and it, it's not uncommon for studies to get halted. So, um, uh, and when uh, a safety event occurs, um, because what happens then is that information uh, gets goes and gets reviewed by uh, the data safety monitoring board um, and also gets reported to the FDA um, and then um, to do to further evaluate. In this case, um, this pause was actually rather and hold actually by, by the FDA was rather lengthy um, for for hold it took up to like, I think it was five weeks. Um, we were poised uh, to start and, and were waiting um, for that period of time. Uh, what I can tell you, it was, was very reassuring um, uh, that uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board and the FDA really took a, a hard look uh, at the data, not only from uh, studies with chimp adenovirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 chimp adenovirus vector vaccines, but they actually went back and and looked at any vector, any vaccine that had had been tested pri uh, pr uh, previously uh, using the same vector, um, and they looked, uh, and I think it's you know well known that that in been um, out there in the press that it was a neurologic side effect, so they actually went and and or neurologic issue, not necessarily side effect, but neurologic issue that occurred or problem that occurred. And uh, they really carefully looked at any neurologic uh, uh, events that occurred in any of the studies and, and uh, you know, came up with the consideration that it was okay for the trial to proceed, so. This was after the reported cases of transverse myelitis, right? Yes. Okay, and um, and I guess the good news is it, it, it went forward much more quickly in Europe. Um, so how do you explain the sort of difference between the resumption of the trial in Europe versus the longer look that the FDA took uh, at the issue? Uh, you know, 
I think um, there it resumed quickly in Europe, probably because maybe they had more ready access to the data and they they saw the information more quickly um, than the FDA did. I think the FDA was being you know was being very cautious and doing due diligence um, and particularly in you know with all the concerns around COVID vaccines. Uh, they really wanted to make sure that it was safe before we proceeded. So, so I think that they were just doing their due diligence. And it, what they had, they actually went back and made requests of from for data from the company from AstraZeneca, uh, and they had to recode some data to get it back to the to the FDA. Okay, well, let's dive a little bit more deeply into safety. Um, in that, some some of uh, our participants today have asked about looking at it across other patient populations, um, you know, since uh, ideally it would be available for children or for pregnant women where there have been complications um, for pregnancy or for breastfeeding women or for, um, you know, uh, patients who have uh, different underlying illnesses or conditions that could be otherwise considered, uh, you know, higher risk. So, so how are the trials taking into account these different patient populations? I know you mentioned CHIP that I think Pfizer is enrolling 17 and 18 year olds. So it sounds like there may be some age de-escalation that's occurring looking for, for younger populations, but um, what's being done to look at the broader safety in these different patient populations? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the kids since I'm pediatrics and, and I'll leave Cindy with the, the pregnant women issue. Um, so it, but I can, chime in on that too. But so for the kids, you know, I, I think the the issue is, um, you know, what's the benefit versus the risk for, for children? I think we really, you know, need to carefully first take a look at that. I think we all, uh, you know, the, the all the data suggests that when children get infected in general, um, they don't get as sick as adults and as particularly adults with older adults and adult, adults with co comorbidities. Um, so, um, but there are those cases um, of children um, that do get, you know, quite ill, sick, and, and deaths have occurred in children. Um, so it's, you know, and if you look and you do a comparison of potential deaths from COVID in kids versus flu in some seasons, it's, it's for which we vaccinate kids, it's not that dissimilar. So. So I think, you know, for and, that- and there's the multi-system and inflammatory, yeah. Yeah, yes, but, yeah. Um, which is, is it, I don't know if there's better data now on which children are likely to suffer it or not. And so I don't I think there's we, that risk, which it, it could be one of the children um, who seems perfectly healthy, but ends up with this uh, much worse later, later response. Yeah, the only thing I can tell, I don't know that we have any exact risk factors pinned down. Uh, I think it's mostly, um, you know, kind of those middle age kids uh, that tend to, uh, who may be more at risk of that, but why we, we really don't know and which kids are going to get that, we don't really know. Um, so the other issue with children and typical for respiratory infections, particularly influenza, um, is that children are often um, the culprits for spreading infection. So, and as um, we uh, put children back in schools um, and do things like that, where they're likely to transmit infection to one another, then, you know, then they go home and they may transmit it to their parent or if they live in a house with a grandparent or extended family to a grandparent or aunt or uncle or somebody else with a comorbidity. Um, that puts them at risk of a bad infection uh, or serious infection. So I, I think you can make a good a case for, for, you know, why vaccine in, in children. Um, now, I think the logical thing then is to kind of de-escalate the age gradually, uh, but not too gradually that it, you know, takes a long time. So I think, it, you know, this is the right time to be, you know, as we're getting safety data on adults, and we, we should have some pretty good safety data pretty soon um, to start uh, evaluating the vaccine in 
adolescents, which really probably aren't going to be, it's not going to be that much different uh, than, than adults, but start to gradually de-escalate the age um, once we get enough, enough safety data in the adults. All right, Cindy, so now you get the, there, there is a plan for children always, which is the approach is an age de-escalation approach, but what about pregnant and breastfeeding women who are generally just sort of off limits? Whenever we're doing drug testing, it's just, you know, you don't get to, you don't get to test it in, in them. I was more prepared to address the, the vaccine in, in children, so I, I'm a bit at a, a default. I would say, I, I think one of the points that I, I think is worth sort of revisiting is how much great safety data we are gonna have for all of these vaccines based on the numbers of participants um, that are going to receive them. So I think that that's gonna be the launching pad for being able to do um, additional studies in children, pregnant women, and even those who um, who are immunosuppressed in some ways, which um, those individuals are being excluded from these phase three studies because they're less likely to respond to the vaccine, but doesn't mean that they wouldn't have some benefit. So I think those three populations are the ones that are um, going to be sort of the next highest priority. I have to say, I don't know of any specific current plans for developing a study and enrolling pregnant women. I certainly have heard um, about the de-escalating the age and there certainly are um, several um, discussions happening about doing the vaccine studies in children, including those uh, younger ones. So I know that those um, plans and thoughts and all of that are in process. I haven't heard that for pregnant women, but that doesn't mean it's happening. There are only so many hours in the day. Um, but I, I think it is, um, um, a population that we always worry about starting uh, or off within a phase three study based on what could be safe in an adult may not be safe for a developing fetus and infant. So I think having the safety data in adults first is the right way to go. And then once we have that moving to um, decide, um, you know, if, if we're lucky, do we, if we have more than one vaccine that's effective, um, and thinking about the safety profile of the different platforms and which is more effective. And I think, I think certainly pregnant women would be um, uh, a high, high priority to receive vaccine when it's available. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of issues to untangle in, in this because, um, you know, pregnant women make it for in healthcare make up a significant portion of the, the women's you know, the workforce. Uh, so, and then the other issue is there are a lot of pregnant women with a lot of comorbidities that may put them at risk. So once you have a vaccine um, with an authorization or approval, um, do you want to be hold, withholding a vaccine and particularly in somebody who may be at higher risk, not because they're pregnant, but because maybe they're obese or, or have underlying cardiac disease or something else that, that may put them, put them more at risk of, of or diabetes um, may put them more at risk of, of severe COVID. So I, I think there are a few things to unpack, uh, unpack here. And I know, um, you know, there are people, I, I actually work with the obstetrician here at Duke who, who does um, vaccine research. And um, I think there are active discussions about uh, doing you know, trials in pregnant women. I, I know there are, in fact, um, I think Cindy's right. We probably do need a critical amount of safety data first, but I, I don't think we, again, can wait too long after that. I, I, you know, I, I really do think um, that we need to move along, particularly for pregnant women who are at high risk. You know, I don't know that we know, for example, that because you're pregnant necessarily puts you at higher risk. I don't think we have that clear information yet, but I think uh, pregnant women may be at higher risk because they have comorbidities. So. Well, and also, I, I mean, pregnant women are often considered to be immunosuppressed. That's part of pregnancy, right? Um, and so, uh, that may put them at higher risk. And there have been uh, a lot of data that has shown that there's, um, you know, potential risk to uh, the developing fetus for the mother getting COVID during pregnancy. And of course, there's mortality risks that are associated with COVID as well, all of which could be really 
problematic. All right, we don't have too much time and I wanna to turn to another issue, which is one that has been pressing on the minds of a number of people who have written into us, which is um, how the studies are gonna continue once there's an EUA. Uh, and I know that this is um, an issue that came up in the October 22nd meeting with the FDA and there's been a request for additional guidance um, for how this will work. So let's assume one of the studies, let, let, let's assume it's um, Pfizer gets an EUA uh, an emergency use authorization. Um, it could be for a limited population, right? An EUA doesn't have to be for an entire population. It could be just for health care workers. It could just be for high risk individuals. There's lots of limitations, but let's just, just let's start with an assumption that it's a, um, an emergency use authorization generally. It's going to be a while before there's enough vaccine for everybody. So I assume that not everybody is going to drop out of the other studies immediately. Um, but for the people who believe that they got the placebo, placebo or go get, you know, antibody tests and discover that they have no antibodies of these other trials, um, how are you going to keep them in the trials to be able to monitor longer term, both whether or not antibody levels decline over time um, and whether or not uh, there are, you know, the, the kind of continued efficacy data that you would want to gather rather than just the first peak and the second peak. And I know this is a, not an easy question for either of you since the FDA doesn't have terrific guidance on it yet either, but um, it's a question that is, that is posed by our, our um, viewers today. Uh, Cindy, you want to tackle it first or do you want me to tackle it or? I'll start and then you, you can add on. I think again, sort of going back to the first um, question, it's all about the timing. Um, and what I can certainly say is that there are many people thinking about this on a daily basis. Um, and the one uh, or one advantage to having several of these studies with oversight and support by the different groups, so the NIH, the COVPN, um, and Operation Warp Speed, is that there are lots of very experienced, respected um, uh, individuals with the right expertise to think about this. And I certainly have heard and am reassured by the, um, the thought and the discussion about the individuals who have stepped up to participate in these early studies and how we have to honor their courage and time and all of that. So, there's a lot of thought going into that. I think there's there, you know, one way it could play out is that if an EUA is available and um, uh, relatively soon before we have a signal from any of these earlier studies is, and it's available to those who are gonna meet whatever sort of tiered, um, you know, rollout of these vaccines gonna be because of uh, being at severe risk. The option would be to unblind the people in a study and offer those who have placebo to then receive the vaccine. Um, it's sort of, a, it's called a sort of crossover design. Um, so and then follow- so under this model, it would be like, if, let's assume it's Pfizer who gets the EUA. You might unblind um, the Moderna study and then say the people who received the placebo would get the, the Pfizer drug. And then you would compare head to head those who received the Moderna vaccine versus those who received the Pfizer vaccine. Is that the idea? Well, I am not a statistician, so I don't know that I want to definitely answer those questions, but the, there, there would be some thought to how you would, you know, continue to follow safety and, and, and some way assess efficacy. Um, so, I, I mean, that's, that's one option I would say um, to honor again, the people who have stepped up to participate in the studies, not withholding uh, what is an effective vaccine for those who would be at high risk. You know, the downside is that to that is that the way that these studies are designed as randomized, placebo controlled, blinded studies is the best way to get an answer about how effective a single vaccine is. So uh, there is some tension in, in um, uh, deviating from that with the um, honoring uh, the people who stepped up to participate and their welfare, et cetera. So I would say to, a large degree, I think it's about the timing about when the EUA is available, how many doses are there, how many people who um, would meet the criteria who are on any on a study, um, and 
I, all of that is going to be followed on an ongoing basis with many, many discussions and a lot of input to decide um, across the different studies how that would be handled. Um, that's the best I can do with that uh, hard question. So Chip, do you agree with that? Do you have a different perspective on I, that? I totally agree. I think it, you know, it, amongst the participants that we have enrolled, it's usually the number one, two, and three question uh, that, that we, we get. Um, and, and, you know, it, um, it's a really difficult one to answer for the participants because um, a lot of this has not been, it's not definitively spelled out at this point. And I think as Cindy says, it's an evolving situation, uh, part of, you know, with the timing of when an EUA will be and how many doses of vaccine will be available and who the EUA is for. I think um, the one thing as investigators um, and, and you know, I've been on calls where this has been discussed as investigators, I think we are all want to make sure that our participants are, are really um, thought of you know, foremost um, because they have stepped up to the plate and, and enrolled in, in these studies. And you know, we've had a lot of conversations with them. So I, you know, we're, we're kind of out there on the line uh, with, the, with the study participants. And so, you know, I think the design that Cindy's talking about would be more of a, you know, I'm blinding within a trial, not necessarily with a different product, but maybe, you know, with the, with the same product. And um, so there's, there's different ways that you can go about trying to, to do that. And those discussions are happening at, at higher levels. Um, and and I, there will be some guidance, I think, in the next, you know, few weeks. Yeah, I assume it's it's difficult not just for the other trials, but for the the trial whichever one receives the first DUA, right? Which is the participants in that trial. Um, you know, there's this question to to Cindy's point about how do you honor those participants? How do you, um, you know, are they first in line to receive the vaccine? If they are, and it's an EUA based on limited data, first or second peak without longer term data, you lose out on a lot of the information that. Um, maybe critical for for longer term both safety but efficacy. Yeah, um, I, I think you you miss you, you clearly miss uh, you, know, you would miss the long term efficacy and you would miss safety data because you wouldn't have a comparison placebo group potentially then if you did did that. So it, it it would be problematic. You could look at duration of antibody response though. So. Um, one of the questions that people asked on the antibody response is a safety question, which is um, there's been some concern within uh, the um, looking at antibodies for, for SARS-CoV-2 that there may be um, antibody dependent disease enhancements. Um, is that a concern in the trials that if you're developing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 that um, rather than necessarily being efficacious, it may actually make it uh, a higher risk. And how would you determine that as part of the studies that there was that antibody dependent disease enhancement that was occurring? Yeah, I would say, I, I don't think it's a concern, but it, it's, it, it's something that's being looked at. I, I think the, this um, uh, vaccine induced uh, um, um, illness had been seen with some earlier vaccines, but mostly in animal um, studies. And it, what, when they took a closer look at it was really about which arm of the immune sy system is responding to the vaccine. And in those cases, it was a predominantly um, what's called a T helper two response versus um, T helper one. And in response to that, I would say in the development of these vaccines, and, and Chip will know this more about this and speak to it some more if, if I don't get it right, um, is that they are now in the development looking at which arm of the immune system is being uh, uh, activated or, or being elicited with these vaccines. And thus far with all, certainly all of the COVID-19 vaccine studies that are going to phase three, um, it's been shown that they um, elicit this T helper one response. So I, was, I think there's less of a concern However, given that it is some concern, it's being um, um, it, it's something that's being looked for within the studies. Um, I, I don't think that it's necessarily a, a, a particular concern um, uh, as a big safety concern across the studies, but something that we can't ignore. I think that's the way I would put it. Yeah, I mean, I so think I get it right. 
<laughs> yeah, you did. So I, I think whenever you develop a new vaccine, this especially a one for a respiratory illness, um, this issue comes up, um, and it, it um, you know, and that's really based on a, a couple of things that happened. There was a, a vaccine for a, a respiratory uh, syncytial virus for young children that was developed. Uh, in the 60s, where we saw actually did see uh, it, it, disease enhancement, where those kids who got vaccine, who subsequently got respiratory syncytial virus, got uh, worse infection, and some of them actually died. Um, so it, this has always raised concerns. It, and I think, as Cindy points out, there there was some lab data uh, in some of the other, um, you know. Uh, coronavirus, earlier coronavirus vaccines for SARS and MERS that, that made us have a little bit of concern about that. Um, but I think in the development of every one of these vaccines that's coming out, um, you know, what's been looked at in the early phase trials is what kind of immune response is, has, is being driven uh, by the vaccine. So in predominantly everyone is, has uh, given a TH1 response. Um, versus what, you know, the TH2 response is the, the immune response that we really kind of worry more about that can, which you typically will see with the uh, disease enhancement. And that's the type of response that was seen with RSV vaccine in the young kids. So, so I, I, you know, we'll be looking for that uh, in the trials, but I, I think, um, and it's really probably the only way to figure that out is in a large trial like this, but, but um, I, I'm not, overly worried that that's what's going to happen here. So, All right. With uh, negative time remaining, let me ask each of you to give me just your concluding thoughts on, you know, both of you have, have long and distinguished careers in, um, in this space and in, in, in vaccine development. Chip, you mentioned earlier that it's, it's happening faster, um, you know, given the public private partnerships and investment and focus than it has previously. Um, a big question on everybody's mind is, how do we ensure that the trials will be met with public trust? How do we ensure that um, you know, these, are, these are trials that the public can accept? Um, and so as you think about uh, the experience that you've had with this trial versus you know, your, your previous experiences, you think about the things like the FDA oversight, the oversight boards and things like that, um, you know, kind of what message would you say uh, to the public about why, when there are results, when a vaccine finally is approved, whether that's one of these or a different one, that they can trust um, the safety and efficacy data and the process such that they should uh, be willing to get the vaccine themselves? Well, I'll, I'll start and let Cindy chime in, but but you know, I, I mean, I've done this a number of years. Um, it is faster, as as I alluded to, than than any process that I've seen. But I, I think um, along the way, all the mechanisms have been put in place um, to assure comparable safety that we would normally see. Um, and I think we have to remember that we're in the middle of a pandemic um, where things really have to move quickly. Um, you, you know, you have have these trade-offs a little bit of, of potential risk and, and, and benefit. And I, I really, uh, you know, we have an urgent, compelling need to have, have a vaccine. Um, and uh, even though this is being done really quickly, um, and, and I think the process that we saw with the AstraZeneca study um, really uh, instilled more confidence for me, particularly as an investigator, that the, the process was, was working the way it's supposed to work. So, and, and moving forward. So I, I think um, I, I'm reassured and I hopefully the, the public will be reassured when we have a vaccine that, that everybody deems is, you know, both one safe and two uh, efficacious. So. Yeah, I would, you know, this is a global tragedy we're dealing with and um, I'm, you know, sort of a new kid on the block in some ways with vaccine trials. But you know, in a very short amount of time, I can say that what I hope people will think about is how many just truly um, inspiring, motivated, experienced uh, people who have been doing this kind of work for many, many years have stepped up and are working 
like crazy around the clock and coming together in new collaborations and to make this happen. Um, so I, I certainly understand the concern. I understand the questions, but I think there, there's a time to step back and be and think about, wow, this is a global tragedy. Isn't it amazing that all of these really experienced, talented, dedicated people are you know, working day and night and working together, um, which working together is not always easy and efficient, but you know, they're making it happen to try and get us uh, an answer and some effective vaccines. So I think it's looking at who's doing it, why they're doing it. Um, and it's, it's not easy um, what all of the, and I used the we outside of myself, it's not easy to do all that in the amount of time. So I, I think it's the motivation and, and who's doing it. I hope that's what people will think about. Well, this has been a terrific and rich conversation. Thank you for being willing to be so open and honest. Um, showing that even Duke and UNC can bridge uh, their divides to work on these issues together. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to all of the participants, both for your questions, but also um, for listening in today. Uh, join us next time for our next installation of Coronavirus Conversations, where we take on the difficult issue of how we think about restoring faith in public health and public science agencies. Thank you to our panelists today. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Chip. Stay well and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Likewise. Thanks, Nina. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone.